Perfectionism, also spelt paralysis, or known as hidden depression, is often argued it comes from the desire to be great, and many top performers have it, but this is wrong. Because the root of perfectionism is fear. It's a self-destructive and an addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect, live perfectly, and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimise the painful feelings of shame, judgement and blame. Perfectionism is self-destructive because perfect doesn't exist. It is addictive because when you experience the shame, judgement or blame, you convince yourself it's because you weren't perfect enough. So, the cycle plays out. You set unrealistic standards which causes you to overwork, producing anxiety. You have a continuous fear of imperfection, which means your standards are too high, so you procrastinate. Because you procrastinate, you feel disappointed with yourself and you criticise yourself. Then you recommit to perfection by trying to solve this problem by setting unrealistic standards again and it goes again and again and again. So this is what we're going to cover within the next few minutes of your time so we can conquer this bloody thing. First up we'll cover what type of perfectionist you are, then the two myths of perfectionism, why doing your best is impossible and the most annoying advice in the world, then the five stages of how to conquer perfectionism, very practical that stuff. Four bonus tips, a summary, then we'll finalise with a analogy and art analysis. Let's go. First of all, for the cheeky bugger in the comments the other day who said I draw my ones like twos, how's that for you? First up, what type of perfectionist are you? We've got three types, sop, oops and sp -b -b -b. SOPs are <laughs> self-oriented perfectionists. This is where you set your own high standards, which are impossible to meet, and you're very self-critical. Next up, we have OOPS, other-oriented perfectionism. This is where you perceive significant others in your life as having high expectations of you that you feel you need to meet in order to please them. A significant other could be parent, coach, friends, other family members. And this is where you experience something called the tyranny of shoulds. The shoulds that are thrown onto you from them about how you should act, what you should do, how you shouldn't be, what you should be more like. This is a very, very tricky place to be. And then the spupapa is socially prescribed perfectionism. This is where your perfectionism is a result of cultural or societal messages you've adopted. For example, with the hustle culture messages we all get shoved down our throat, you might believe you should be in a certain place by a certain age. I remember I used to work in a Costa Coffee when I was young and my manager, she was a lovely woman, but she was 28 and she was always miserable. Always, always rushing around, always running around like a headless chicken because she had this inner belief, I spoke to her about it, that she was 28 years old and when she was 18, she felt as if she should have her own business by 26. And the fact that she didn't just made her life a complete misery. That's an example of this because she had that expectation fed to her by society and culture. But to get even more, by the way, I'm self-oriented perfectionist. Yeah, 100%. And another note, this video is a note to self. So I'm joining you on this journey. Don't want you to think that I'm completely exempt from this. To simplify this even further, let's just look at it in the lens of two forms of perfectionism. Constructive or destructive perfectionism. One of the very valid arguments towards people labelling themselves as perfectionists is sometimes you're not a perfectionist, you just have very high standards. But the way to differentiate between perfectionism and high standards is this dichotomy. A constructive perfectionist, let's use that term, for example, might be a swimmer. And their goal is to beat their personal best in every single race. If they win the race, that's a bonus, but that's not their goal from the get-go. And they don't derive their self-worth from winning. A destructive perfectionist would be the swimmer who wants to be the perfect swimmer. They want to win every race. And if they don't, they feel no sense of self-worth and they beat themselves up about it. So high standards becomes perfectionism when your high standards are now ruining your life. Now moving on to the two myths about perfectionism. Number one is perfectionism leads to success. Absolutely not in most cases. There's a study which I found in researching for this video which showed that when you have a group of people who all have the same level of talent and intellect in a given subject, perfectionists in that group perform less well. And the second myth is perfectionists get things done efficiently and effectively. Again, I can tell you from experience, this is complete BS. Perfectionists deal with low productivity and procrastination. Going back to the wheel of perfectionism we showed at the beginning, you set your standards so high, 
So you procrastinate to give yourself relief from having to face your standards. Just to illustrate this a bit further from a personal point of view, one of the main ways I struggle with perfectionism is making these videos. It seems as if I just upload one or two videos a week, boom, and I don't think anything else about it. But what you don't see is me tearing my hair out, even though I don't have any, behind the scenes, editing every single video, trying to make sure that I'm not repeating myself. I'm Every clip is concise and relevant, and there's no mistakes on the board. And guess what? Every single video has a mistake on the board because I'm just so caught up in my perfectionism, I'm not actually paying attention to the mistakes. Also, the amount of people who have come to me and have said, I really want to start a YouTube channel, and, I'm, and I say to them, okay, why haven't you? Oh, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of this, I need this, I need that. It's just perfectionism masquerading as false self-care. Okay, now moving on to point number three, why giving the advice of just do your best is the worst advice in the whole world. Okay, so you're scrolling on Instagram and you come across some cretin who's posted a photo of them lying on a lilo, the sun is shining in the background, they're clearly in a swimming pool while on holiday, and the caption is, living my best life. How the bloody hell can you tell that you're living your best life? Meaning, how can you tell you are holding all of your physical, mental, emotional and spiritual capabilities up to their maximum? This is precisely why the advice of doing your best is absolutely ridiculous. It's because doing your best changes. Some days you're going to wake up with the motivation of a sloth or you're going to be sick. So. If there's anyone, drop in my pens, I'm this pumped up. If there's anyone watching this video, my dear fellow muchacho or muchacha, if you have any idea about how to do your best, please tell me. Because since the age of 18, and I had these messages shoved down my throat of all these self-help gurus and psychologists saying, you're too good for perfection, honey, just do your best. Every time I tried to do my best at something, I was always left with the conclusion, was that my best or could I have done better? You can never tell when you're doing your best. So, aim for better or different. The philosopher Immanuel Kant said, us humans can never be perfect, but we can strive for perfection. And it's this sense of getting better in whatever we're doing that gives ourselves the feeling of progress and a metric we can actually measure. I try this with my videos. What is the 1% thing I can do differently in this video that I didn't do in the last video? Not try my best. Upon this theme, one of the reasons why self-acceptance is so hard, because at the root of perfectionism, you're not accepting yourself, right? You're trying to work on yourself and all that. One of the reasons self-acceptance is so hard is because it's much easier to distract yourself with work or scrolling than to sit in full acceptance of your loneliness or your feelings of inadequacy. Who wants to do that on a Sunday afternoon? But it's the only thing that will help you accept yourself. We want things instantly. We want to shoot up like a swamp plant instead of building the foundations of our inner attitudes and mindsets. But anyway, I'm getting too preachy. So now let's cover the five ways to conquer perfectionism. But before we do so, and you probably won't want to hear this, but do you remember at the beginning of the video I said perfectionism, also spelt paralysis, or known as hidden depression, yeah, this hidden depression thing, there's a psychotherapist who's written a whole book about it, and uh, here are 10 signs that you might have this hidden depression. First up, and perhaps most obvious, is you are highly perfectionistic, fueled by a constant critical inner voice of intense shame and fear. You demonstrate a heightened or excessive sense of responsibility and look for solutions, emphasis heightened or excessive. You have difficulty accepting and expressing painful emotions, remaining more analytical or in your head. You discount, dismiss or deny any abuse or trauma from the past or present. You worry a great deal but hide that habit and avoid situations where you're not in control. Five more. You are highly focused on tasks and others' expectations, using accomplishment as a way to feel validated. Yet, as accomplishment fades, new pressure assumes itself and any success is discounted. You have an active and sincere concern for the well-being of others while allowing few, if any, into your inner world. And three more. You hold a strong belief in counting your blessings and feel that any other stance reflects a lack of gratitude. You have emotional difficulty with personal intimacy, but you demonstrate significant professional success. And lastly, 
You might have accompanying mental health issues that involve anxiety, control issues, OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, panic, or eating disorders. Now, the thing to note is you might have thought, hmm, I definitely have a few of them while reading that list. I'm not a psychologist, so this isn't a diagnosis, and I'm not proposing this to you so you can unnecessarily diagnose yourself with something. They're just interesting takes on this new concept called perfectly hidden depression from the psychotherapist Margaret Rutherford. If you want to check more of this stuff out, I recommend reading her book, Perfectly Hidden Depression. But to dive deeper into this and to find out how we can combat it, here are the five ways to conquer perfectionism. Okay, point number one is consciousness. This is where you need to practice something called non-judgmental mindful awareness in those moments when your perfectionism is rearing its ugly head. That's a judgment actually, so I just demonstrated how not to do it. In those moments where you feel perfectionistic tendencies, simply label it to yourself out loud. Oh, this is perfectionism. During this video, I've had to stop and start many times because my perfectionism has prevented me from doing a sequence as well as I wanted it to plan out. So I've had to stop myself and say, oh, this is me being perfectionistic, I need to take a moment to calm down so I can approach this from a realistic point of view. Perhaps get a journal out and write down over the last week where you've noticed your perfectionism creep up. And please, 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 muchacho, muchacha, I ask you to not do it with judgment because when you do it with judgment, you're only gonna spark the negative spiral of your perfectionism. So after you've become aware, number two, as Margaret Rutherford highlights, is commitment. You have to make the choice to want to overcome your perfectionism. But asking a perfectionist to commit to something is asking for trouble. So there are five main barriers you're gonna run into at this stage, and here's how to combat them. Number one is you'll set a rigid commitment in the sense that you'll try to overcome your perfectionism perfectly. Notice how <laughs> perfectionism is just one big mental spiraling loop of perfect. So what you'll do is you'll try to make the perfect routine for yourself or you'll try to instill a perfect practice to help you curb your perfectionism. But you'll mess up so you'll feel guilty, you'll procrastinate which will make you feel worse, you'll judge yourself and you'll stay in this spiral. So to prevent this, set your commitment not as a commitment per se, but as an intention, with the understanding that you intend to overcome your perfectionism, but sometimes you will falter. Number two is you might begin with a goal that's too large. You might convince yourself you have to overcome your perfectionism within a week, but I guarantee, as we'll cover in a few points time, your perfectionism has been mentally programmed over years and years of your childhood upbringing, your adolescence and your adulthood as well. So what I would suggest is focus on one area of your life that you feel perfectionism is negatively impacting you and make the intention to just let go of your perfectionistic rules in that area. Don't start with everything. The third barrier you might face is going it alone and not asking for help. Asking for help is a perfectionist's worst nightmare self-admittedly, but the way to combat this is reflecting situations you were in in the past where you were being perfectionistic and imagine yourself asking other people for help in that situation. What would it have looked like? Treat this mental imagery in the same way as an actor would treat rehearsing their lines for their script. Hopefully this will highlight how your desire for control prevented you from asking for help. Number four, two more, and this is a really interesting one. The fourth barrier is dealing with the fear or shame of giving up your persona with its coping strategies while your stress increases. You might challenge yourself in situations to not enact the coping strategies your perfectionism wants you to, which will make you feel more stressed, meaning you will have a greater desire to lean into those coping strategies. And this can feel like shedding your armor. Again, giving up your persona. But what I would encourage you to do, which has worked for me, is notice that you don't die when you don't give in to your perfectionistic coping strategies. To give you an example, as I've mentioned, I get quite perfectionistic with these videos that I make, wanting there to be no mistakes at all. But what I've done in the past is, I've recorded a video, notice there's a mistake, my perfectionism wants me to record the whole video, which might take me hours to do, but I upload the video anyway with the mistake in, so I can learn, oh, 99% of people don't notice the mistake anyway, and even those who do, offer it from a place of genuine feedback, love you boys, and best of all, 
I didn't die. <laughs> and lastly, the fifth barrier to overcoming your perfectionism is other mental difficulties you might have that worsen due to the pressure. For example, OCD, generalized anxiety disorder, eating disorders, of course, it's important to stay safe while you're healing and work with a professional if you have any other mental health difficulty. Now we've covered the barriers, point number three in terms of conquering perfectionism is confrontation. My favourite part. In this sequence you want to outline all of the beliefs and rules underlying your perfectionism which have been governed by your culture, society or your own mental programming. Beliefs are something you accept to be true. Your rules govern how you behave. For example, you might have the rule that I always smile no matter what because your underlying belief is people won't like me if I don't smile. The key in this part is you want to replace your unhealthy beliefs with more beneficial ones. One more example of a belief and a rule which is likely apparent in your perfectionism is the belief. People who fail aren't liked. So your rule is never try new things in case I fail. Now you've highlighted them, replace them. So the new belief becomes failure means I'm learning and growing. Your rule is expose myself to tasks I'm avoiding. Over the period of a few weeks, catch yourself in those perfectionistic ruts to highlight what belief you're currently feeding into, what rule you are governing, simply by analysing how you're acting. That will tell you what the rule is. Write them down, capture them and replace them for the mental programming you would like to see flourish within your cranium. Be patient with yourself, because again, this mental programming has been done for a long time, so it takes a while to reprogram. Point four, two more, is connection. Going through these stages will do one very big frightening thing. It's going to awaken you to a lot of emotions and experiences you have long repressed, which is why most people don't do things like this. It's gonna awaken you to your vulnerability, the reality that perhaps your perfectionism is actually just people pleasing, and you'll awaken your fear. Again, your fear of shedding an old persona to awaken into a new one. So at times you're gonna experience the positive reinforcement of overcoming your perfectionism. So you're tapping on the accelerator, but then at times you're gonna freak yourself out and slam the brake. Think of the analogy of a turtle. I've tried to draw one down here. When it gets scared and notices there's danger, it retreats into its shell. The same will happen to you as you go through these stages. You will experience change, freak yourself out, and retreat back into your shell, which is normal. But there's one principle I want to highlight to you in terms of emotions. You feel it or live it. If you don't feel the emotions that arise within you throughout this process, they will creep into your life in subconscious ways and you'll blindly live them out. If you don't connect with your sadness, vulnerability, fear or emotional pain, they are going to hijack your behaviour outside the scope of your awareness. So when you feel these emotions, you kill two birds with one stone. One, you give them the attention that they want, meaning you get to know them and you learn how to navigate them. And two, you get to learn the messages that they're teaching you. Here's a video all about how to manage your emotions. Check that out if you want to. If you want to go one step further in your introspection in this stage, here's an exercise for you to do. Get yourself a pen and paper or a whiteboard and draw a timeline. Then write down particular ages in your life. Two years old, four, eight, 10, 12, up till the age that you are now. And for each age, write down one good thing and one bad thing you remember happening at that age. Your goal here is to see particular connections and patterns between things that happened in your life and your perfectionism. You do this non-judgmentally and you honour all of the experiences that made you. Then if you find some compelling evidence for the cause of your perfectionism, perhaps when you was eight years old, your mum and dad threw immense expectations onto you when you began playing sports, you no longer have to identify with your pain because you can simply highlight, oh, well, that makes sense that I have such a perfectionistic tendency. Now, if you're doing this fun, but very revealing exercise, two things I want you to know. One, know the difference between fault and responsibility. It can be someone's fault that you are the way you are, but it's your responsibility for how you deal with it. And two, do not do an exercise like this when you're feeling particularly down, depressive, anxious, or you have some inner turmoil going on. Do this when you're feeling calm, rested, and in the mood to do it. Because if you do it when you're feeling down, you're gonna be throwing flames onto a fire. Lastly, point number five, change. 
Remember the 10 signs of hidden depression we covered before we went through these five stages? May they appear right now. There we go, appeared like magic. Killed my right arm doing that, just for you guys. <laughs> Hope comes through change in your behavior. So what you do in this final stage is you work through this list one by one, perhaps with a friend or alone, and you see how you can challenge falling into these points. Now, again, my friend, don't do this perfectly. Find the easiest one that sticks out to you and just start there. Now I'll pan the camera like this so you can take a screenshot if you want. Okay, now before we get into the analogy and art analysis, which I'm excited to do with you guys, let's now cover the four bonus tips. We'll speed through these. Number one, ditch the self-blame. To reiterate the point, it's not your fault that you're a perfectionist. It's your responsibility, but I guarantee it's probably through childhood programming. If you watched the video we covered on how to manage your mind so it stops behaving badly, I believe was the title, we covered something called the fridge door syndrome. Very quickly, imagine the scenario. You're a child, you spend a day at school where you have to draw a painting for your mum and dad. You come home to your parents and say, Dad, Mum, Mum, look, look what I drew for you at school. And they respond to you by saying, Oh, darling, you are so talented. You are so smart. I love this drawing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it on the fridge door for everyone to see it. Subtly, what they've communicated to you as a child is your self-worth is dependent on what you achieve. Maybe we're all a product of the fridge door syndrome. Number two, consider when does your perfectionism work and when doesn't it? I guarantee there are some moments it serves you kind of well. So reflect back on those and notice what can you take from that situation, but maybe tone down going forward. And number three, watch out for perfectionism's brother, procrastination. We've mentioned that word many times throughout this video. Do you want to know the greatest hack on how to overcome procrastination as shown in one study, which was very well documented? The best way to overcome procrastination is forgiveness. I know it sounds cliche and everything, but there's a study that shows students who procrastinate and then forgive themselves perform better on exams. And number four, Give yourself permission to fall in love with failure. Have a look at the social media you use, the people that you follow. Are they only sharing their successes and their greatest achievements whilst hiding all of their failures and shortcomings behind the scene? Follow people who express vulnerability online and unfollow anyone who gives you that feeling that you need to catch up with them and compete. Remember, as Naval Ravikant says, escape competition through authenticity. What we got next? Oh. Analogy and art analysis, okay. Before we move on to the analogy and art analysis, there's one principle I want you to keep in mind. You cannot solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. And as the renowned psychotherapist Harriet Lerner says, once you change your steps, your old dance can't continue as usual. Okay, before we summarize and finish this video, and bit of an unnatural environment for me, away from the whiteboard, oh no. What we're gonna cover now is an analogy I found on the internet from a incredible graphic designer called Alessandra Maria Radlu Sechu. She's a technical artist who created a short 30 second illustration of perfectionism that we're gonna look at now. And while I'm showing her animation on the screen, I'm gonna read out her description of it so we can get a better understanding of perfectionism from an artistic point of view. She writes, the first scene represents a visual metaphor of the maladaptive perfectionism, and it consists of three shots. The first shot starts at a wide angle to show the environment, which amplifies the symbolism behind the scene. It is set in the sky above the clouds. This chosen level on the vertical axis of the world can be deciphered as the high standards of the negative perfectionist. The numerous clouds also reflect an enchanting, dreamy initial state of mind. Mind. The bust element is made of wood, an aspect which anticipates the appearance of a tree. The tree itself symbolizes growth and prosperity in many mythologies. The growth of the branches is a sign of ascension to reach in the set goals. The second shot illustrates the same visual effect, but the camera movement differs. The main focus is on the procedural growth, while the rotation of the camera supports the dynamism of the shot. Additionally, the proceduralism implies a hierarchy that means good organizational skills. 
Even though the first two shots picture a feeling of hope, the final shot changes the plot. It is the moment when the head-shaped cage falls from the sky and cuts the branches. The cage is an image of the self, and the process of fracturing the branches is a manifestation of self-sabotage, where the own growth is annihilated. The branches levitate as feathers in contrariety with the tough substance of the tree. This action defies the laws of physics. The second scene is a visual metaphor of how the adaptive perfectionism works. The interpretation key is hidden in the set. The subject is placed in the centre of the shot, in the spotlights. Being on a stage also implies that it is exposed to a public situation which requires letting go of fears. The dress is cheerfully dancing, which is a sign of optimism. The Rubik's Cube is solving itself and can be translated as the entire process a healthy perfectionist has to go through to reach his goals. There should be a small offset when the cube gets finally solved. It means that perfection has not been achieved but it is still close. Also, the assembled face is uneven. As the individual embraces the imperfection, the dress continues to dance. I thought I would add that little sequence in so we could take a break from all of the information on the whiteboard. Back to the board though. So, in summary, perfectionism comes in different forms. Destructive perfectionism is associated with hidden depression. To conquer your perfectionism, recognize the role that destructive perfectionism is playing in your life. Plan ways to overcome the obstacles that are preventing your change. Confront your unhealthy rules. Connect with the difficult feelings you've long repressed. And finally, recognize and celebrate your progress. Thank you very much to Margaret Rutherford for her continued work on this incredibly dense and intriguing topic. And finally, thank you to you for your time and attention that you've paid to this video. Drop a comment about how you've struggled with perfectionism if you're struggling right now or how you've overcome it. Share with us in the comments anything that you disagree with, agree with, or something that has helped you overcome perfectionism. In the meantime, stay disciplined, playful and dangerous. Adiós muchachos y muchachas.